Hi. I'm from Berkeley Lab, so I'm actually neighbors with Jennifer. I'm just up the lab. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, oh, uh, so something this, happened. This is going to tell us about what? Yeah, so, um, so I'm a physicist by training. So my background was uh, undergrad, I did particle physics, and then for grad school, I switched over to materials physics and, and doing basically quantum mechanical calculations on supercomputers of, of materials that were like hot off the press that we would make in the lab, and we're like, okay, what is this? And we try and understand it. Uh, but I got frustrated because um, we had these wonderful tools for telling us properties, but we had no means of generating new examples. And so I'm going to talk about that. It's the whole reason why I got into deep learning. Wow, that's really freaking. If, if, I, if I will talk about it, maybe, maybe I'll okay, tap dance. Great. Oh, okay. Right. Great. Right. So we have tests. Without further delay, here she goes. Okay, wonderful. Hello. So again, I'm at Berkeley Lab, which is very close to UC Berkeley. It's five minutes up the hill because it's very steep. Um, and today I'm going to talk about making an autoencoder to operate on 3D geometry uh, for those of atomic structures, but it could be any 3D geometry. And uh, here we go. So the geometry of atomic systems, and what I mean by atomic systems are crystals, molecules, nanoclusters, proteins, anything that has atoms that are represented by points. Um, so the geometry of atomic systems is very complex. And despite that, it has a kind of a certain symmetry to it and, and different hierarchies of geometric patterns. So there's a lot, of, a lot of patterns in these materials. So here's just an example. Let's say I have an atom that is surrounded by six other atoms in the form of an octahedron. You can imagine I could take that octahedron, connect it to another octahedron, so they're sharing two atoms, and then I could build from that circles and from that a hexagonal lattice. Now, I could take a similar motif. Now, this is, comes from, I think it's like chapter three of my thesis. Um, these kind of beautiful materials where you take sort of a similar motif of these edge-sharing octahedra, they have a very symmetric distortion. And from this, you can build a whole infinite series of structures that have very different topology. So it's very interesting. From simple building blocks, you can get quite complex structures. Um, so if we want to go about making new structures, it turns out the state of the art for generating new atomic structures uh, are genetic algorithms and random search. They're quite effective, especially for high pressure phases. Um, so as I said, they're, they're quite good at making structures. There's various uh, issues with complexity. They can only do so many atom types and hierarchies and things like this. But there's no learned representation between structures, which is a little disappointing because as a physicist, I have a strong intuition for kind of what things are related to each other. And current approaches for learning generative models of atomic systems, they either generate atoms sort of sequence by sequence, which for molecules I think kind of makes sense from a chemist's intuition, but it's quite artificial in the context of crystals and things like this. So they have to usually put an artificial ordering on the atoms, which I, I personally am not the biggest fan of, or they operate on voxels, which is good because it has you know, 3D structure to it, uh, but it's it really scales poorly. So if I have a bigger and bigger system, this isn't going to go well for me because it scales like n to the third. Um, a lot of these methods don't really treat geometry or symmetry. For molecules, this makes sense because you have molecules kind of fluctuating at, at, at temperature, but for crystals, it makes a bit less sense. Um, and a lot of these methods don't handle the fact that atomic systems have hierarchies at different levels. Okay, so what we want, and it's the royal we, this is what I want. Um, I want to convert geometric information, so 3D coordinates of atomic positions, and I would like to convert that into features on a trivial geometry. So in this case, a point. I'd like to eat away the geometry, convert it into features, and just have a trivial geometry, and have that encoding be sufficiently robust that I can bloom it back out into the original geometry that I had, and back again. And this would be very nice, because you know maybe the intermediate representations are quite useful, but then I can do interesting mathematical operations on the latent space, like a shown in, in many autoencoder type molecule or uh, autoencoder type architectures. Okay, but again, I really want to emphasize that, you know, I, I want to use the fact that atomic structures are hierarchical and constructed from recurring geometric motifs, again, referencing these octahedron. And so the way that I'm proposing that we go about doing this is sort of mirrored. Um, we need to encode the geometry of our structure while simultaneously encoding the hierarchy, kind of iteratively, and, and then do the opposite. So decode the geometry and decode the hierarchy. Okay. So before we go about doing this, uh, because I'm a physicist and we love symmetry, uh, I like to think about what assumptions we want built into our neural network. So there's kind of two big things uh, that I want built into the neural networks that I use. One is that atomic systems, again, form recurring patterns at multiple length scales and things. Uh, they occur at multiple locations and orientations, and I don't want my neural network to be wasting time trying to learn that an octahedron is an octahedron in a different orientation. I'd like my, my filters, if you will, to, to identify an octahedron in any orientation and understand that it's in fact rotated. So if these, these two octahedral complexes in this rubidium manganese chloride crystal, they're the same, just tilted. 
uh, and, and their relative orientation is also important uh, with respect to each other. Additionally, the properties of physical systems or the things, how you would describe uh, physical systems, they transform predictably under rotation. So if I have, for example, two point masses, so I have a big mass and a small mass, uh, and they have maybe features like a velocity and acceleration. Um, and if I go ahead and, and, and change my coordinate system, I, I apply rotation to my coordinate system, the scalars, so the masses, they don't change, but the vectors do. And what I like, my neural network should not spend time doing is understanding these rotations. I'd, I'd like to give it that information, the fact that um, space and physics is invariant under translation and rotation. And so our data types that we want to use in this, this network are geometry and what are called geometric tensors, these properties that transform under, under rotation and translation. And these data types assume Euclidean symmetry. Um, so first we built neural networks that have Euclidean symmetry baked in, and we call these Euclidean neural networks. Originally we called them tensor field networks or 3D steerable CNNs or Klebsch-Gordon networks, but now we're kind of rebranding to a kind of a unified Euclidean neural network framework. Um, and basically you can think of them as very similar to convolutional neural networks with some important caveats. First of all, we have very special filters. So if you have a general convolutional filter that's W, um, we're doing W of R vector, meaning it's a continuous filter, and that's because in this case, uh, we're gonna be dealing with point clouds um, rather than images, but you can also deal with images if you like. Uh, so we, we constrain our convolutional filter to be uh, separable into a learned radial function and then spherical harmonics. And the reason why we're using spherical harmonics is kind of a deep reason, but I think, oh, I didn't, okay, I didn't have that part of it. But basically you can think these spherical harmonics have different frequencies and they're grouped together. And if you have something expressed in a single frequency of spherical harmonics and you rotate your signal, it's still in the same frequency. So it's a really nice property. Furthermore, everything in our network is a geometric tensor. And what this means is that we can't just use scalar multiplication to multiply things. We have to use sort of the, the more generalized tensor product. And kind of what this means is if I have a vector and a vector and I tell you to multiply them, what I just told you was very ambiguous because you could do a dot product, which produces a scalar. I could do a cross product, which gives you another vector. I could do an outer product, which gives you, which gives you like a three by three matrix. So um, basically, okay, we have specialized filters and we have to obey tensor algebra in our network. Okay, what does this mean? Um, it means that you can, you can classify Tetris pieces after seeing them in only one orientation. So if I train these networks to classify these eight different Tetris pieces and it does it 100% correctly, then just from the math, it can classify these pieces in any orientation. And I wanna note that two of the pieces are chiral, meaning they're different handedness. So they're mirrors of each other. And so you can't distinguish them just from radial distances. There's actually angular information you have to take into account. Perhaps a more concrete example is, let's say I want to make a network that predicts molecular dynamics forces. Um, if I have a network that can correctly predict the forces of a molecule in one orientation, you automatically are guaranteed that it'll predict the correct forces in another orientation, because it's the same forces with uh, modular rotation. Okay, so how does this deal with our autoencoder? It's important that I tell you a bit about the input to these types of networks. So our input is the geometry and then features on that geometry. So again, taking our toy example of the masses, uh, we have the geometric locations of those two point masses. And then we have features on those geometries with the masses and the velocities and the accelerations. The key thing here is that we categorize our features by how they transform under rotation, which at first might seem a little weird, but okay, scalars, these are things that don't change under rotation. Those are L equals zero frequency. I'll get to, it does connect back to the spherical harmonics. Um, and then our vectors are L equals one. So we go ahead and can categorize and you can have things that change with twice the frequency. It's a little bit less intuitive, but five minutes, good. Um, but yes, so uh, there's a connection with the spherical harmonics. So basically our filters are spherical harmonics and then you can kind of think of our features as being attached to spherical harmonic functions. Um, and, and so, you know, what's nice about this is that our features, we can either interpret them as things like vectors, energies and things like that, or we can uh, think of them as functions of 3D space, so literally linear combinations of spherical harmonics. And this is the key thing for creating our autoencoder, is that to autoencode, we need to be able to turn geometry into features. 
And the way that we do this in the autoencoder is that we use spherical harmonic projections. What does that mean? Let's say I have this tetrahedron and I want to project that tetrahedron onto the center atom. Um, it ends up being a linear combination of the projections of each atom um, respectively onto that center atom. And I really, what I'm just doing is I'm just evaluating the spherical harmonic at that point in space, treating it as a delta function because who likes integrals anyway? Um, and then basically you can sum up these spherical harmonic signals and that ends up being the signal for the total tetrahedron. To give a more concrete example, let's say I have geometry and then I'm doing a spherical harmonic projection up to some frequency of spherical harmonic. I think in this case it's like L equals five. Um, you end up getting this, these little blobs. And what's cool is that you can actually go back and forth by getting the peaks of the spherical harmonic signal. You can turn it into an actual point set. So there's no ordering on this, which is pretty cool. Um, and then this is sort of the kind of the, uh, the way that this autoencoder is able to go between geometry and features. Okay, so how do we have an autoencoder? So we have two types of layers. We have a pooling layer, and this is allow allowing us to convert geometry into features. So first, we have our geometry, we convolve, we look around, see what's going on, and then each atom actually clones itself according to some spherical harmonic signal it produces. You put points on the peaks of that signal, and then you cluster those points, and this is allowing you to do some sort of learnable clustering. And then we use a symmetric clustering algorithm. It's like k-means, but with symmetry. And then once we have the clusters, we basically uh, do kind of a convolution operation of, okay, these points are going to be part of this cluster. I'm going to gather these features and, and have a new feature on the new point. And then we continue on. So you can kind of iteratively reduce um, the features at different levels. And to decode, similar thing, except for we kind of start off by, okay, I'm at a point, I have features, and I'm going to generate more points, which will be kind of the next set of geometry. And again, we cluster just if, in case there's overlapping points, and we combine it and we continue again. And then, how many minutes? Two? Okay, great. So this is last two slides. So kind of an example of what's going on. Um, so, you know, a good example, let's, let's try Tetris. So what's cool about Tetris is there's four points. And so what we're going to do is we're going to iteratively reduce it from four points to two points to one point, and then one point to two points to four points. So here's an example for one of the chiral pieces. And you start with this geometry, and then what it does is it learns some sort of little signal. It's like, okay, I'm going to create more points on these lobes, and then I'm going to cluster those points. And so I end up having two new points that are actually right in between those sets of two on the edges. From that, it's going to cluster again to give me a trivial geometry with a feature on it, and then we're going to go do the reverse. And what I'm showing you here is I'm actually showing you there's multiple um, steps of training, and I'm showing you only after the first one, so that you can see one of the things that you have to deal with is that sometimes you have a point that shouldn't be there in the end. So they used it to store information on it, but it's not going to be part of the final geometry. So the next step uh, in the training algorithm is actually to learn when to delete points. Um, but you can kind of get a sense for how um, you're able to articulate new features. And then here's an example. So we told it it could, you know, it could make two points if it wants to, but there's certain symmetric configurations in which there's no way to have two symmetrically distinct clusters. Uh, so the, for the corner piece, um, you end up only getting one cluster, and you're still able to, to reconstruct and carry that information through the autoencoder. Okay. So I want to give a big thank you to my colleagues, so Mario, who's in the audience, and, and maybe yeah, Constantine's over there, and then Ben, who is in New Zealand. Um, and I want to give a big, sh big shout out to them, and also that they're the developers of the repository that we work with, which is E3NN, uh, and I'll, I'll give a link to that in the next slide. So big thanks to them, and this also a big thanks to the TensorField Networks team, which was the paper for Equivariant Networks that I was on um, while I was an intern at the, on the Google Accelerated Science team. So with that said, um, a lot of work to do. We have a functional autoencoder and now we just need to put it through its paces. And we really prioritize symmetry considerations and the interpretability of intermediate geometries. And we're able to recursively turn geometry into feature vectors and back again. And then here's all the information if you'd like to uh, play with some equivariant networks. With that, I'll take any questions. Thanks.